do, do. Good morning. Welcome to the Elmwood Community Church. We're so glad you could be with us today. Our music director, Mr. Jerry Belak, is on vacation, a much needed one. So today we have James O'Connor, who's going to be filling in and giving us some accompaniment on the hymns. And we're going to get things started right now with our lay reader, Daisha Haxton. Thank you. 
done against the godly. All day long, you are plotting destruction. Your tongue is like a sharp razor. Your work is treachery. You love evil more than good, and lying more than speaking the truth. You love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. But God will break you down forever. He will snatch and tear you from your tent. He will uproot you from the land of the living. The righteous will see and fear and will laugh at the evildoer, saying, See the one who would not take refuge in God, but trusted in abundant riches and sought refuge in wealth. But I am like a green olive tree in the house of God. I trust in the steadfast love of God forever and ever. I will thank you forever because of what you have done. In the presence of the faithful, I will proclaim your name, for it is good. This morning's second reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created. Things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have a first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his flesh and body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him. Provided that you continue securely, established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a minister of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its minister according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches and the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he who we proclaim, warning everyone, and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And this morning's third and final reading is from Luke chapter 10, verses 38 and 42. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at Jesus' and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her, then come and help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. And this ends our readings for this morning. Blessed be to God.
Good morning. Everybody staying cool out there? No. no. <laughs> I don't think it's possible this morning, but um, I don't know. I don't have any extra fans, I don't think. Oh, I do. Anybody need a fan? I heard that. 
I'm glad you didn't choke on your water. Um, but yes, I'm sometimes sarcastic. And my mother was pretty sarcastic. So sometimes I don't even hear or know or I'm aware that I respond sarcastically. But I do. And I think of when um, I said to my brother earlier in the year or even last year, um, do you want anything out of the garage? Because I was getting thinking about the move. And um, he said, yeah, I want all those cans and bottles that are empty in your garage. And I said, thanks. He was being sarcastic. So it comes naturally to me, our family, we tend to be sarcastic. But I realized that it's not necessarily the best way to interact. When I was in Duxbury, Massachusetts, as a youth group leader, as a minister in training, I had a woman that was the mom and of one of the kids, or a couple of the kids, and she worked with me in the youth groups, and she said to me, you know, sarcasm isn't always the best way to interact with the young people. And I said, oh, okay, you're right. So I, I stepped it way back, and I wasn't sarcastic. But I still forget that lesson sometimes. It's a lesson I've learned, and so, you know, sometimes in life you have to learn lessons over and over and over again. This is the case with words. So we know that words can wound, they can heal. Often the difference is whether our words are just. So the tongue. I'm going to talk a little bit. Background. There are many organs in the body, heart, lung, stomach, liver, kidneys, and so many more. And they're all marvelous in their own ways, including the tongue. So one organ, though, is distinctly underrated, the tongue. Just think of all the things that it can do. It can enlarge, it can contract, it can twi twist itself into a number of shapes. It's essential to the digestive system. When we eat, it turns food around in our mouths, causing it, coating it with saliva. Then when we swallow, it pushes the food on its way down the throat to the stomach. I think of one of my good friends, her mother-in-law is in, I think in her 90s, can't remember how old, um, and she, her, her esophagus is closing and she doesn't want to have the procedure where they open it again. So she's choking on food regularly and she eats quickly and we have patients at the hospital for special care who do the same thing. I um, can picture one of my patients who always asks me what I have for breakfast, um, eating a huge spoonful of egg salad. And somebody else saying, slow down, slow down. You gotta chew that. And egg salad's pretty mushy, but you still have trouble swallowing. So a lot of people I know are on period diets and um, at the hospital, not in, in life. And, um, one of, my, one, of, one of the guys that I see regularly is really cranky about that. And he wants to go out and catch rabbits and cook those and eat them. So the puree diet is not cut in the He would also like to go to New Haven and get some pizza. If you've seen the PBS special, um, Pizza Love Story, it makes, it makes all of us want to go to New Haven and get pizza. I've never been to New Haven. So the, di the tongue is essential to our digestive system. Anatomy teachers call the tongue a muscular hydrostat. It's closer to an elephant's trunk, an octopus's tentacle, or the powerful so-called foot of a snail than to any other part of the body. So it's our, also our principal organ of speech. Another thing we do at the hospital for special care is a lot of people have speech therapy regularly. Some of them can't talk at all, and some of them just can make sounds, but any progress, even raising your eyebrows to say yes or no, is progress. So it's not always about eating, but it's our principal organ of speech. There are no fewer than 44 distinct sounds in the English language. Linguistic scholars call them phone, phone I can't. Phonemes? 
Yes, that, phonemes. Thank you, Kelly. And the tongue has a role in producing nearly everyone. The tongue shapes the air we exhale into words, repositioning itself with each syllable at various locations within the mouth. Those who have the misfortune of losing their tongues or even a portion of them are often rendered incapable of speech. This morning, on Sunday mornings, there was Gabby Gifford who has aphasia. And she said, the words are in my brain, but they don't always come out the way I'm thinking them. And I know a number of people who have aphasia. And it's so frustrating for them because they know exactly what they want to say but they just can't say it the way their brain is thinking of it. So the ancients knew how important the tongue was, or is. We can see it in Psalm 52, but there's no celebration of the tongue's marvelous capabilities in this psalm. To this ancient singer, the tongue is a curse. The tongue is a de deadly weapon, a sharp razor. And you know, if you've been caught by somebody else's wit or sarcasm or even mean comments, you know that the tongue can do serious damage. You know that it can be a sharp razor. And this in Psalm 52, it's biblical scholars call this psalm a psalm of imprecation. imprecation. The target of the singer's righteous rage is anonymous. But it's not hard to discern that this enemy, oh mighty one, is powerful. This adversary is treacherous in spirit and relentless in battling people of faith. A villain who loves evil and delights in plotting destruction. So it's a powerful person who plots destruction. You love all words that devour, O oh deceitful tongue. So what suffering precisely this adversary has wrought also isn't specified, so we don't know. But it clearly has something to do with the spoken word. Some bullies use their fists. Some use their words. They use them to make people feel bad or guilty or sad or really even to hurt them. I think of when my parents had their 50th wedding anniversary and I said a prayer. And afterwards, my brother, who's no longer with us, but my brother said, yeah, that was boring. So, that was boring. It wasn't a long prayer. It was just a short prayer before we ate. So, I don't know what I said or did that was boring. But, he said that was boring. And he said it to get to me. Okay, my parents have been gone a while. And I still remember what he said. So sometimes people say things without thinking. And then sometimes, probably in my brother's case, he thought about it and he said it anyway. Words are the common coin of our social relationships. Sometimes we belittle them with like disparaging political speech as only rhetoric. We complain about trivial small talk conversations, not realizing how subtly they function in our relationships. Yet words can be so very powerful. Just think of what it means to hear someone say, I love you, or to hear that same person say, I never want to see you again. Words can be as airy and insubstantial as dust motes floating in a sunbeam, or they can be deadly daggers running us through to the very heart. It's the lethal use of words that Psalm 52, the person who wrote Psalm 52, is concerned about. So the flip side of this is, of course, is that the tongue can also unite us with others. Lovers may use a knowing look from their eyes, the gentle touch of a hand, or a powerful embrace to build connections with their beloved. But the communicative, communicative power of all these body parts is nothing compared to the words produced by the tongue. Neuroscientists are learning more about how this works. In a recent TED Talk, neuroscientist Linda Feldman Barrett describes how the words we share with others actually shape their brains and ours. Part of being a social species, it turns out, is that we regulate one another's body budgets the way 
the ways in which our, our brains manage the bodily resources we use every day. I had never heard about body budget before I researched some of this this week. For your whole life, outside of your awareness, you make deposits into other people's body budgets, as well as withdrawals, and others do the same for you. The power of words over your biology can span great distances, but also across centuries. If you've ever taken comfort from ancient texts, such as the Bible, the Quran, any ancient text, You've received body budgeting assistance from people who are long gone. Words are sort of common currency we're constantly exchanging with our neighbors. If you pull out a dollar from, bill from your wallet, it says on the top, Federal Reserve Note. And you can see who signed it on the bottom. Not you, but whoever was the Secretary of Treasury at the time that the bill was made. We're quickly to say of our current batch of greenbacks, that's my money. But in a certain sense, it's not, and it could never be your money. Money is part of a great common pool that by social agreement, we freely exchange with others. And by doing so, we exert a powerful effect on their lives. Dr. Baird's point is that our words function in a similar way, who knew? How we use them can bring our neighbors joy or de devastation. So then the passage from Psalm 52 goes on to talk about truth and false words. Truth, a wise person once said, is like fine china. If it breaks, it can be mended, but it will never be the same again. Do you remember the last time you broke something precious? Something china, maybe? Um, if it breaks, it can be mended. Maybe you were lifting a teacup off the upper shelf and it slipped from your hands, falling end over end in the slow motion way that only precious things can fall. Until it met the floor with a crash. Sick at heart, you gathered up the pieces and put them away out of sight. And now, weeks later, you take the fragments and glue them back together. It's never the same again no matter how expertly you reunite, you reunite the pieces. The last time this happened to me, the shades in my apartment are not very good, and they, they come out occasionally, I forget. And um, it fell and hit a portrait, a photo, of my dad and his three siblings when they were all young. And the frame fell, and the wood part broke. And I need wood glue, wood glue to fix it. I don't have wood glue. Can I remember when I'm in the store to get wood glue? No. So I'm gonna have to put it in my phone, buy wood glue, and, and then make sure I go to the store. See, these are the things that happen when you're over 60. You have to write everything down. You guys hopefully don't have to worry about that yet. Maybe some of you too over there. But some of us do. So truth is like a fine china or something precious that might break. If we fail to use it, it's never the same again, no, no matter what we do. This is the effect that lies have on human relationships. So let's not talk about the so-called white lies, those garden variety deceptions, most of them kindly meant. No falsehood is to be admired. But white lies rarely do extensive damaging. Far more devastating are the broken vows, the betrayals of trust. Now, in marriages, vows get broken. I haven't gotten married, so I haven't broken that vow. But vows get broken. If there's abuse, if there's something that happens, if somebody is addicted, a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, people can break vows. And then when somebody else leaves the relationship, they're not necessarily breaking the vows. The vows have, the vows have already been broken. But that's not necessarily how people see it. And that's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the truth. The truth 
They say the truth will set us free. But the truth is an important aspect. When I was younger, I used to say, oh yeah, I did that. I got, I, I uh, did all those thank you notes. And it wasn't true. And I didn't realize that covering my butt was not telling the truth. And so then I realized that if I said something that wasn't true, I had to then go to the person and say, sorry, that wasn't true. I lied. And I, I learned this in a landmark education forum and then started dating a guy who pretty much the whole relationship lied to me. And I think the, part of the attraction was that he thought I was someone who lied. Even though once I realized it, I had to correct the behavior and not lie anymore. The relationship didn't end well because he had been lying to me the whole time. So, lesson learned. Don't, don't necessarily think that's a good quality to look for in other people. But perhaps there's a betrayal of trust lurking behind the psalmist's complaint about words that divide her. There is no pain more lingering, more deep than the agony of discovering that a promise made long ago has been habitually and deliberately broken. It's like a crack in the china teacup. The seam may be repaired, and the cup may be serviceable for years afterwards, but never again is it the thing of beauty and delight that it once was. So one old saying goes, the devil speaks, sometimes speaks the truth. It's possible to wound a friend just as thoroughly with facts as with lies. The criticism may be true and may, may even be needed, but if it hits the person where self-esteem is weakest, it will tear them down instead of building them up. I have, I have some very, very good friends, and I learned years ago that my job as a good friend is to support them in what they are going through. It doesn't matter that I have opinions or thoughts about certain things. It matters that I support them in their time of need. And it's sometimes hard. Sometimes you have to speak the truth. And it is difficult for people to hear. But as a good friend, you need to also hold back your words sometimes. Because they're not going to do anybody any good. It was William Penn, an early Quaker leader, who once said, If thou thinkest twice before thou speakest once, thou wilt speak twice the better of it. I'll say it again because it's old English. If thou thinkest twice before thou speakest once, thou wilt speak twice the better for it. So think, think before you speak. So it's easy, it can be easy to dismiss any remark, our own or another's, as just words. But words are of tremendous importance because of all the ways they function to strengthen the social fabric connecting individuals and community, like individuals of this church in the community of the church. Words matter. The most significant and upbuilding words are those that are fundamentally just that reflect design, divine justice. Sometimes we zero in and condemn certain words that seem superficially offensive. Cuss words, they're sometimes called. It's significant that such four-letter words, and we all know what they are, are called that. Cuss really means curse. And in ancient times, a curse could be deployed as a deadly weapon. So words, as I've said, have the power to offend, but they also have the power to build up. The Creator has given us tongues to use as tools of righteousness. The words we fashion using those tongues can serve the cause of justice or injustice. They can hurt and wound or heal. They can be of kindness or callousness of compassion or exploitation, of love or hate. In choosing our words, may we choose wisely and choose words with love. We pray that we can make this so. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Today we come to our time of prayer. We are praying for Chris, who had an accident yesterday and is in the hospital. We're praying for his healing. Um, we're praying for David Lee, who is healing. We're prayer of celebration that Maddie is home. We're break from the Navy and got to spend time with her family on vacation and gets to celebrate her brother's graduations today. We are thankful that Wendy has healed significantly, that Edie is healing, that Clara is healing, and are there other prayer requests today? Victor? Continue prayer for Edie. For Edie. And also keep in Ukraine. And also keep in Ukraine. In Ukraine. Oh, okay. Ukraine. Even like this, I can't hear you. to you this morning, grateful for so many things in our lives, the celebrations, the joys, for graduations and birthdays, and Maddie being able to visit at home from the Navy. We celebrate the healing that has happened in people's lives. We celebrate the healing that has happened in Wendy's life and is happening in Edie and Clara's life. We pray for healing for all of us. For all the people that need your special care and touch. We pray for Chris, who had a bad accident yesterday and is in the hospital. We pray for his healing. We pray for all the people who love Chris and the people he loves. For David Lee and for Fiona. God, when somebody we love is hurting, we have difficulty focusing. And we pray that you would help us to focus on the prayers needed to heal. We pray for Carol and Kevin and Sarah and Terry and Nancy. And the list could go on and on for those who need your special healing today. We pray for Pat and her sister Joanne, for Eleanor and for all the people who are homebound from our congregation, who we love and care for from a distance, for Carol and her son, Jim, 
We ask you, God, to be with all those who need healing for Charles and Robert and Serena. And we ask you fervently sometimes. And yet we ask also that your will be done in the lives of those who are hurting. We trust that whatever happens, people are with you. Whether we live or whether we die, we are in your embrace. We pray for all the people in the Ukraine who are devastated and for the Russian people that they would pull back from the war that they have started and continue. We pray that there is a way to end this war where there seems to be no way. We pray for this church, this congregation, that whatever the future holds, the people who are part of this faith community can continue to build relationships of love. And that the church and its people would be able to continue to minister to the needs of this community. We pray for Viola and Mary, for Barb, who's going on vacation. We pray for all people who are on vacation that they can get the rest and relaxation that they so need. We love you, God. We trust that your words will fill our hearts and our lives and help us to know to do your will and to give us a sense of your peace, your love, and your joy. We pray this and so much more in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's National Ice Cream Day. So, eat ice cream. Join me in the doxology.
our service for this morning. We're glad you could join us. Uh, come back again next week, same time, same station. Bye for now.